An Empire of Ice and Fire by Longclaw 1-6 Chapter 10 Khaleesi Six months later It isn't like Robert to call a meeting of the small council so early. Eddard Stark, Hand of the King, remarked to his companion, both meandering down the winding halls of the Red Keep. Renly Baratheon nodded, delicate features contorted into a pensive frown. Something must have spooked him. News about someone or something he would pay particular attention to. The youngest Baratheon sibling laughed. I can count on one finger the matters that fit on that list, not involving jousting, drinking, feasting or sex. Quite so. Ned considered Robert an old friend. One of the reasons he had accepted the position as Hand of the King, and accepted as true as unsavoury aspects of his personality. All the peace and prosperity of the last decade had been John Aaron's work. Robert was too busy immersed in his vices to make an actual attempt to rule. In the corner of his eye, John spotted a thatch of golden hair next to the Master of Coin. What is Joffrey doing with Lord Baelish? He asked Renly in a low whisper. The youngest Baratheon clicked his tongue. They've been rather chummy in the last few weeks. Littlefinger often talking to the boy about this and that regarding the kingdom. At that moment, they both of the two of them turned, falling on Ned and Renly. Littlefinger managed to put on a warm smile, while Joffrey viewed them with barely disguised derision. I have no idea why, mind you. No one but his mother can stand that boy. His mother and Sansa. Ned added, it was not a match that he wanted, seeing the boy in action over the past few months. How Sansa could still care for him after what happened with her wolf. Walking into the small council chamber, Ned put it aside for another day. Robert's anger clouded the room from the moment Ned entered. Not angry, he was livid, face near purple with rage. Varys, the plump master of whisperers, stood off in a corner, trying to make himself go unnoticed. Your grace? Littlefinger finally asked, having entered last from his discussion with the crown prince. A wood-fitted scroll found itself chucked at the master of coins head. Only an agility normally reserved for a younger man allowed him to dodge it. Seven freaking hells! He sputtered through each fact, growing purple with rage and drink. She's alive, and with that little traitor, pregnant. Before the four assembled could draw the wrong conclusions, Robert continued, The Targaryen witch is pregnant. Ned's blood turned to ice. Barristan was supposed to keep her hidden. Varys, or Littlefinger, freak. A furtive glance was directed at the two. Apparently Ned wasn't the only one having spies on Essos. Wait. Pregnant? Daenerys was apparently pregnant, and he wasn't in any doubt over the father. Gods. John. Leah. Your grandmother now. It killed him, but he couldn't smile at the joyous news. For it spelled problems. But I thought she disappeared into the Essos countryside with her brother when the betrothal to the Dothraki fell through. Renly gasped, relaying what Ned had told him, Robert, in the Winterfell. Freaking Barristan must have found her, the traitorous snake! I should have killed him along with Rhaegar. Waiting for a servant to pour him another glass of wine, he turned to his hand. Ned! The king's bellow caught his attention. Are you hearing this shite? I know. This is disconcerting. I honestly thought she was dead. The, the lie oddly rolled seamlessly off his tongue. Letting out a hiss, Robert threw a cup at the wall, wine sloshed onto the stone floor. Now there will be a dragon spawn there. Shoot! Brother, Renly said, I highly doubt a woman alone in the world of Essos. Shut it, Renly. If I wanted a gay's advice, I would ask for it. Face reddening, Renly nevertheless shut up. I must nip this in the bud now. The witch must die. 
The ice in Ned's veins only increased in concentration. Robert. To kill a mere child. A young woman with child herself. That isn't the man you are. It actually was, but this had to be stopped at all costs. The king wasn't hearing any of it. You listen to me, Ned. If you do not accept my order, then you can pack up and get out of this city. Tempted to do just that, Ned nevertheless clamped his lips together. Varys, do you have any contacts amongst the Dothraki? <clears throat> A few birds may reside in Varys Dothrak, your grace. The eunuch responded. Good. Send a message. Tell the horse lord Savage that he can name the amount of gold or horses he wants if he delivers the witch, her child, and Barristan's head to me. Shutting the latch to his office nearly an hour later, a sigh left Ned Stark's lips. The gods have mercy on me, he breathed. He couldn't fathom how John Aaron could have lasted even one year amongst this pit of vipers. Cersei was more a jackal than a lion. Pysel more a cutthroat than a maester. Renly, a friend, but overwhelmingly self-serving. And Peter Baelish? Had it not been for Canton's reassurance that he could be trusted, Littlefinger perturbed him the most. The man was a snake, rich thanks to lax morals and oily to the core. And now he was grafting himself to Prince Joffrey. That worried Ned. But on seeing the letter resting on his desk, the apprehension started to fade. Picking it up, he opened it and began scanning the scroll. Lord Stark, yes, the information you off informed me of is greatly worrying. Something is brewing. What, I cannot be sure. Lord John Arryn would never inquire into Robert's bastard if it wasn't of importance. I never trusted my sister-in-law as much as I could throw her, and I know that she is ultimately behind this. There is no other explanation that makes any sense. I will head to King's Landing with all haste. Regards, Stannis Baratheon, Lord of Dragonstone. Smiling, Ned realised he could nip Joffrey's bud quickly if the middle Baratheon cooperated. But there was still the matter of Daenerys and his grandchild. John's child. Wordlessly, he drew a slip of paper, inscribing words meant only for the eyes of the bare knight. Stepping back, Barristan Selmy quickly wielded his wooden training sword into a blocking position. A thud rang out as it hit the other blade, the all knight quick to block the swift slashes from his opponent. The smooth wood on his neck ended the sparring quickly as it began. A smirk formed on his face. Yield. Pride flashed on his face. First time you've beaten me. Daenerys beamed exhaustively, soaked with sweat, several hands of silver hair loose from her braid coating her forehead. It won't be the only time, Sir Barristan. She let the sword drop, robbing her rounded belly, though I think you may have let this pregnant princess win. If I was, I wouldn't tell you. He winked, earning a glare from her. Gods, it's like I'm staring at Rayella. In a month since Ned Stark bound him to her by the Northern Iron Vow, since he had fled Westeros and the toxic Baratheon court to uphold his original oath to Rhaegar, the former Kingsguard had seen Daenerys grow from a shy young girl into a vibrant, confident lady, one he was growing to view as a daughter of his. Not one day since had he regretted his decision to leave with her. Even when the great barrister in the board was forced to take care of not just a princess, but an expectant mother, as he had done with the princess Elia through her two pregnancies, so too he did with Daenerys. She did never tell him who the father was, nor did Barristan ask. It wasn't his place. Returning to their makeshift campsite with a bucket of river water, Dorea's jaw dropped, knowing exactly what the two had been doing. Khaleesi! The former half Dothraki pleasure slave set the bucket down and rushed to her charge. You know better than to spar in your condition. A gentle yet forceful arm guided her to her seat. The babe is due any moment. Do not overexert yourself. The beautiful but feisty young woman sent Barristan a death glare. The old knight raised his hands in surrender. I can't disobey an order from the princess. And besides, I used the wooden swords and avoided any blows to the stomach. I knew you took it easy on me. Daenerys huffed, sick of being treated like a child. They just want John's babe safe. A sigh left her lips. 
unable to stop the smile spreading on her face. She placed her hand gingerly on the rounded bump, only for a thump to strike her palm. Calm down, little one, she cooed, rubbing the eighth-month belly baby bump with an unadulterated adoration. Inside her stomach was a little boy or girl, a tiny human, half her and half John. A mix of pure happiness and grief crossed her mind at the thought of her father's child. Hush, my sweet, she couldn't help but say in her native Valyrian. Moona loves you, and I know Papa would love you just as much. Tears came to her eyes. I love him just as much. I wish we could be a family. Daenerys closed her lids tightly. She would not give up hope. Her child simply kicked against her hand yet again, as if indicating his or her assent. As Dorea dashed off to skin the rabbits he had caught earlier, Arison took a seat next to Daenerys. The dragon princess refused to give in, refused to quit, doggedly insisting she could train even when the ship's healer proclaimed her with child between White Harbour and Valantis. And now the determination had paid off. Daenerys was steadily on the way to becoming a master swordswoman, rivaling Visenya Targaryen herself. You're getting better by the day, princess. Hand absentmindedly rubbing circles on her belly. I still can't beat a warrior in a fight. You're getting there. Just need to perfect your agility. Fighting a massive knight, the proper maneuvers can get around him and hit him in vulnerable places with ease. He eyed the Yi Ti sword. Barristan had never seen anything like it. The gently curved blade, steel the same colour as her hair. It suited her and her fighting style. I still don't know how the bastard of Winterfell got a Valyrian steel sword. Eyes darkening, Daenerys narrowed them at Barristan. Do not call him that. He gave her an apologetic look. Forgive me, princess. Barristan shifted into a different topic. Most great swords have names. Have you thought of one for yours? Pursing her lips, Danny seemed lost in thought. Old Valyria had a class of elite warriors that used cunning and agility to defeat stronger enemies. Like me. She glanced at the sword fondly, running a finger along the smooth steel. I am inclined to call my sword by the name of those warriors. Saracen. Saracen. I think it, that is a fitting name. Barristan stood. I shall tend the horses. Rest here. Smiling at the retreating knight, Daenerys sheathed her sword. Her gaze suddenly fell upon the three eggs, resting in padded saddlebag that never left her side. Reaching into, she picked up one that was pure black, red lines marring the intricate scales. Illyrio and John had been right. They were a pinnacle of beauty, a symbol of her people, a relic from her family's past. What Danny wouldn't give to see them fly through the clear skies once more. Without thinking, she stood and walked to their roaring campfire, placing the ossified egg right into the flames. It was not out of any plan, but pure instinct, yet the egg called to her, begging to be put in the heat. In the same life-giving fires that birthed old Valyria, that destroyed old Valyria, yet allowed Haas Targaryen to unite Westeros under its banner. Soon all three eggs nestled in the flames. Flickers popped and crackled around the smooth scales. Out of nowhere, Danny heard something. Movement? A flutter within the eggs, as if they were indeed alive. Intrigued, her hands pressed against the scorching eggs and feeling the flutter, almost like her own child. Khaleesi! At once, Dan Danny pulled her hands away, shocked by Dorea's scream. What were you thinking? You'll get the... Grabbing her hands, the other woman quickly inspected them to find no injuries. No burns, not even redness, just Danny's distinctive pale skin. A dragon does not burn. She opened her mouth to speak, only to cry out at the sudden stab of pain. Dorea watched as a great gush of wetness trickled down her trousers. The baby, Danny said weakly, feeling heavy and lightheaded all, all through the agony. 
Jurea quickly laid her on her back. Sir Barristan, come quickly! But Danny couldn't hear, blackness overtaking her. With a great heave, Alistair Thorne shoved another boy, grin if his aged mind remembered correctly, forward. What are you waiting for? Get on with it. The previous lad had barely even tried to spar with the young Tarly boy, the one who Aemon always found in Castle Black Library. Not a warrior, he was, but based on how each of the other trainees that Thorne knew of looked at Jon Snow, he had a benefactor. Attack him! Gren seemed to whisper something to Samwell, who barely stuck out his shield with the wooden sparring sword. The lad immediately went down. Yield! Yield! Wrinkled lips curled into a smile, face contorting with anger. Thorn shoved Samwell aside and advanced on Jon Snow. You think that was funny? Earning Amon's respect, Jon said nothing st and stood his ground with a smirk, just like his father. Enough, Alistair, the old maester called out. I am sure you have more pressing duties as master of arms. Scowling at his nominal superior, Thorne dressed down the other recruits and then stormed off, sparing one last look at Jon Snow. Aemon didn't notice the young command step behind him. There's a lot that resembles him and the lad, isn't there? Sighing, Aemon Targaryen sheared away from the railing and headed back indoors. He tightened the loose robe on his wrinkled frame. Yes, and much that resembles her from what I have been to her, told of the she-wolf. The old maester may have been near blindness, but he swore he could have seen slight tears that clouded Benjamin Stark's eyes. The lad's birthright is wasted here at the wall. Closing the doors, the two were safe from prying ears and eyes as well. With the Lannister at Castle Black for another week, one had to be extra cautious. It is he who is the rightful heir. Don't you think I know that? Benjamin shot back. That she wouldn't want her only child condemned to the chains of our vows? I don't even think the boy wants them himself anymore. Simply that he doesn't have a choice. Reminded of that fact, Aemon's tired eyes glazed over. The princess, he whispered wistfully. Love is the death of duty, Benjamin. We saw that with my great nephew, but there is derived a strength from it that cannot be measured by human minds. An old hand reached for a pitcher of wine. Benjamin took the offered cup that Avon poured for him. At this point, the safest place for him is here, and the safest place for her is on the great grass sea. He chuckled darkly. <laughs> my brother says a storm is coming and either of them will be tempting targets for the vipers and opportunistic swine. Wildlings and barbarians pale in comparison. And if what that he's a deserter says is true? Toothless gums smacked together, eyes narrowing at Benjamin. If the others have truly risen. Grey eyes rolled. I highly doubt that. Amon levelled a finger at Benjamin. Remember, Lead Ranger, complacency and closed-mindedness have toppled smarter and stronger men than you or I. Legs wobbling, he finally allowed himself the luxury of sitting down. I still don't know why Ned Stark entrusts me with Jon Snow's name-day gift from his father. He gazed at the stone wall in a specific spot, hiding a secret alcove where the precious bundles rested. He stored them in Winterfell for 16 years, doesn't he? If the storm does come, Benjamin replied, and our families play as large a part as we both feel they will, this is the only place they will be truly secure from the wrong hands. Nodding, the maester glanced out of the window. Tired eyes settled on John. He wrapped a friendly hand around Samuel Tarly's shoulders, helping him with his swordsmanship. You speak true. Pardon me for being selfish, but it feels wonderful to not be alone anymore. Cold. That's the first thing Danny felt was in a deep chill that burnt her skin and knifed through her very bones. Blinking, her teeth chattered as she wrapped her arms around herself to keep as much warmth in her body as she could. 
but it wasn't enough. Fire could not kill a dragon, but ice could. Suddenly, the cold vanished. Taken away, the silver-haired princess began to notice her surroundings. Grey. Everything was a uniform grey. Dull. Lifeless. The stench of metaphorical death and decay. Something once great that was now rotted and crumbling from its very core. Stepping forward, Danny immediately noticed she was not clad in her Khaleesi leather, but rather in a dark grey dress, hem and skirt reaching down to two combat boots tailored to fit her. The outfit of a warrior queen. Stepping gingerly through the ruined edifice of the building, the pentagram-styled windows shattered grotesquely. Daenerys suddenly found herself rising high in the air. Whatever she was in disappeared, the ground beneath her morphing into a massive pyramid that towered over the dreary landscape. In the distance, a golden figure stood tall, hair the colour of precious metals, as two booming horns resounded far and wide. What had been hundreds of thousands fell prostrate, forced to worship this being. The setting shifted again. Danny flung what seemed halfway across the world back into the freezing cold. Torch appearing in her hand, the darkness all around her vanishing into blinding white as a massive gate opened to reveal a massive blizzard. What awaited her on the other side made her heart skip a beat. Jon Snow. In the flesh. Slightly older, more hardened, and even more handsome than before. She walked up to him, as if on autopilot, his gentle hand cupping her cheek. My queen, came the gravelly voice she loved so much. My empress. My king, Danny replied with all the affection in the world. My emperor. In the distance, a faint moan suddenly appeared. Immediately her wolf tensed, turning around and unsheathing his sword. The moan grew louder, turning into an all-encompassing raft that dro- chilled Danny to the very fibre of her being. John looked at her, eyes replaced with flame. Winter is here, and a black, black mess fell upon them. Shooting upright, Daenerys woke to her panting breaths and sweat pouring from her brow. A dull ache permeated from her entire lower half. Only the low light of several lanterns banished the stuffy darkness of the tent. She's awake! Turning her head, there was Dorea, her face spread in a wan and relieved smile. You gave us quite a fright, Khaleesi. Reaching for a water skin by her furs, Danny felt instantly better as she drank. What? What happened? Eyes then widened, her hand going for her stomach. The bump was no longer there. Gods, my child! Sir Barristan was at her side almost immediately. Calm down, princess. Trust me. Motioning to Dorea to pick up a bundle swaddled in brown cloth. They are fine. They? Looking to her front, all words left Danny as her violet eyes stared in wonder. Gently, two small bundles were placed in the crooks of her arms. It was obvious. Twin. I gave birth to twins. Two perfectly healthy little babes. Barristan beamed, playing the part of a proud uncle. The same he had with the Prince Rhaegar so long ago. A boy and a girl. Danny looked over at her two children, already falling helplessly in love with them. Her son sported a dark tuft of hair, tiny eyes already showing a hint of violet like hers. Her daughter was the opposite, sporting the silver mane of a Targaryen, but eyes as grey as smoke. They were beautiful. They were hers. They look just like him. It made her love for them even more. Heart swelling with utter adoration as the twins took to her breast. Waiting for Dorea to leave, Barristan crossed his arms and stared at Danny, with eyes both stern and inquisitive, rocking the now full princess gently in her arms. She knew immediately what he was thinking. Princess. I hope I can trust you, said Barristan. 
The statement was flat, Danny sparing a glance on the twin to keep her grounded. This would be quite emotional for her. Someone who she wished was here wasn't and could never be. The former Lord blinked, features softening. You can trust me with your life, princess. Kneeling, a gentle hand caressed her son's soft cheek in the bassinet. Twins. They do not have complete Valyrian features. I am their mother, Sir Barristan. Daenerys knew what he had assumed, that Viserys was their father. She shuddered at the thought. They are half Targaryen. Aye, their features are Targaryen. The prince's eyes and the princess's hair. But the other features, they are Westerosi. His gaze settled on her once more. And I know this to be true. Their father is a northerner, isn't he? Tears prickled in her eyes. Unable to stop herself, Danny nodded. Barristan reached out and stroked her arm comfortingly, as a father would. Was it him? Ned Stark's bath. Son. His image flashed before her eyes. Danny took in the chubby face of her daughter. Though looking mostly like her, those grey eyes of his, of her love. Yes, Jon Snow is their father. It was said. There was no going back now. Their love had given Danny two tiny little beings, part her and part what well, John, Targaryen and Stark, dragon and direwolf, fire and ice, she said softly. Something imperceptible crossed over Barristan's face. Her companion and protector seemingly processing the immense news that had been disclosed to him. Does anyone else know that you had? He chose his words carefully. Had children with Jon Snow. Danny warned firmly, rocking her son in her arms, kissing his flushed brow with all the tenderness in the world. She sighed. No, no one else knows. Daray probably put things together, and I have a feeling Lord Stark has an idea if the news ever got back to Robert. He was too observant not to figure it out. Remembering the feeling of ice against his throat, the determination in Ned's eyes, Barristan agreed with her. What do you intend to do now, Princess? Both twins snuggling into her arms. Danny closed her eyes. She had the future of House Targaryen in her hands. Viserys was out there somewhere, holding a stronger claim, but childless and incompetent. No man would follow him into battle. Danny was certain of it. They would need an army. But there was already a good plan Lord Stark prepared for them. A good plan. One she was only more determined to pull off. But could she accomplish it? Could she, a woman, reclaim her family's birthright? Her children's destiny as royals? If I could bet on anyone being a ruler, I would bet on you my beautiful dragon. If there was anyone Danny trusted, it was her love. I am Daenerys Stormborn of House Targaryen, blood of Aegon the Conqueror and Old Valyria, she announced. I will not let my brother destroy our birthright with his incompetence. I will not allow my children from being denied their place in this world. They are Targaryens, and as the true queen of the Seven Kingdoms, I legitimise them. Wide eyes. John stared at his mouth to say something, but stopped. Proud tears filled his eyes. He had wished for this, prayed for this, knowing that out there everyone that could only rule and Daenerys deserved it. Silently, he lowered himself onto one knee. Daenerys of House Targaryen, first of her name, Queen of the Seven Kingdoms, I, on this day, pledge my life and my fealty to you. As soon as she acknowledged his pledge, he looked at the true infants. What shall their names be? Rhaegar, Danny said without hesitation. His name is Rhaegar, Prince Rhaegar Targaryen. There seemed no better name for her beloved son 
than that of the noble crown prince, her eldest brother that she had never known, but had heard so much about. He was a great warrior, something she knew John would support. A noble name for a fine prince. Barristan smiled, already protective of the royal children. They didn't have a crown yet, but Daenerys was his queen. No one in the entirety of the world could hold a candle to her. And the princess? Would you like a Targaryen name or a northern one? Brushing the soft silver tufts of hair on her daughter's head, Danny knew it should be a northern name. John deserves it. Though he was half a world away, he was their father. My love. There were plenty of women in John's life. His family, whom he loved. One thing stood out, though. A rambunctious little spitfire that she remembered hanging on to his every word, thirsting with love for her brother. Arya. Princess Arya. After John's sister. Barristan nodded. Ned Stark's youngest daughter. He laughed. A hellion! I remember. Little Arya took that moment to yawn, tiny form wiggling in her blanket as she drifted off to sleep. Setting her down next to Rhaegar, Danny kissed them both on the forehead. Muna loves you, little ones. Face radiating love and adoration. Inside, Daenerys's will hardened into determination. I will make you proud, my love. They had ridden in without incident. An old scraggly man in fading leather armour, a young girl holding a babe, and another young girl holding a second babe. They looked like the kind of derelicts one might assume would arrive in Vea Stothrak to peddle whatever wares they had. Other than a few cursory glares, along with one very keen glance from a burly warrior, they passed unmolested, knowing just the man they wanted to see. Leaving his tent, wiping the last of the day's sweat from his brow, as the moon rose above the mountains, ringing the settlement, Jorah Mormont began to take towards the merchant quarter, drown his sorrows and boredom in one of the half dozen lean to taverns the wily Norvosi merchants and smugglers ran for the benefit of the Dothraki warriors. Not as good as the ones in Bravos from his days in the Golden Company, but wine was wine. But such was not to pass. An insistent hand grabbed him on the shoulder pulling him back into the tent. Not willing to invite the ire of the Dothraki by drawing his blade, Jorah was ready to lash out with his fists, until he caught a glimpse of the attacker. Barristan Selmy? he said in shock. Of all the people to run into in Vaeus Dothrak, the former King's Guard and now new Queen's Guard smirked, looking Jorah over. When Ned Stark told me he had a man on the inside of the Dothraki horde, I was surprised... Yet not surprised it was you. Thought you'd be parked in a Bravosi tavern, drunk off your ass. I was, for a long time. Jor admitted. Such a fall for a powerful knight and respected lord. But you have joined a noble cause, beginning to redeem yourself. His face darkened slightly. If you betray her, then I'll cut your throat. Jor nodded. I will not. Out of the corner of his eye, he noticed the silver-haired girl. Khaleesi! His eyes widened. You shouldn't be here! At the squirming bundle in her arms, he broke into a sweat, catching on quickly as to why Ned Stark had been so insistent he make contact with them. You really shouldn't be here. Such is not your concern, Sir Jorah. Daenerys replied, voice that of a queen. I was told by a mutual friend... That you would both be my sworn sword and my adviser. But such requires a certain loyalty and trust in my decisions. This girl was truly something. Jorah had a feeling he had chosen right. It's not that. Ned Stark sent a message to me a fortnight ago. Danny's eyes widened. Apparently Robert Baratheon got wind of you and your children journeying to Veastothrak. A hitched breath left Danny's chest. Arms holding little Arya even tighter. He wants you and your babies delivered to him and offered Khal Drogo a reward for doing so. Her expression hardened, eyes blazing. This changes nothing. Sir Barristan, Sir Jorah, we continue with the plan. KG and guarded long before, she divulged it all to them, at least the parts she wanted them to know. 
are we understood? Heads turned as someone banged on the door of Jorah's hut before Eva could answer. We know you have the Carl's bride. Come out. And whatever happens, she informed them with a flat expression, eyes as cold as Valyrian steel. Do not open the door. Do not do anything besides what I have told you. Are we clear? Jorah and Barristan glanced at each other, only nodding. We are at your command, your grace. Quietly, they snuck out the back of the hut, Barristan and Aurea clutching the sleeping Rhaegar and Arya. Grabbing the bag nestling the eggs, Daenerys smirked darkly, taking her steps outside the hut towards the waiting blood riders. Shoved into the massive tent, more a semi-permanent structure constructed out of thatch, wicker and wood, the blood riders slammed the two wooden doors shut, trapping Daenerys inside. Low firelight came from four massive oil braziers and a single campfire in the middle of the large sandy atrium. Smoke wafted through a hole in the roof. Nine men sat cross-legged in a semicircle along the back wall. Nestled in the middle of them, at the head was her former intended. Carl Drogo. Look at this one! Another Carl laughed in the Dothraki tongue. He was to Drogo's right, large and burly, long braid of a warrior trailing behind him. Only Drogo's was longer, pale enough for the sun to burn her skin. He turned to the senior most Carl. And this is the one you wished to marry? So friggin' tiny. Barely a child. Another Carl added, I doubt you would fit. They all laughed. Daenerys had a ghost of a smirk, knowing they did not realise she understood them all. Daraya's lessons were bearing fruit. Many gave her lewd stares, one that disgusted her. I'd like to see what the Drogo's Khaleesi is like. Her fists clenched at her side. Only John would enjoy such looks from her. That can be arranged, Drogo boomed, the first time he had talked all night. Come in in an hour and you can try. That brought the house down with laughter. Great Carl, it seems that this one the men with the iron clothes were asking about. A junior Carl from the left edge told Drogo, they would give us 10,000 horses and a man's filled with gold for her. Danny raised an eyebrow. Lord Stark was right. Her heart clenched at John's father risking his life to save hers. Drogo waved his hand with a hiss. Frig that vat king across the bitter water. If I want horses and gold, I'll rape half the cities between here and Pentos for them. I will not let them take the Khaleesi that was promised to me. There were murmurings. Moro, do you not agree? Carl Moro nodded. You can find far more Khaleesis. Take Kohor. You'll have five hundred if you wish. Westerosi horses are powerful and strong. Get them and their gold, but demand more. I have always wanted a freshly forged Valyrian steel sword. He grinned. Drogo closed his eyes, considering it. If all of you are quite done, Daenerys barked out, suddenly drawing the attention of the gathered cars. They seemed quite surprised. You speak the true tongue? Carl Morrow asked, blinking. Beside him, Drogo just narrowed his eyes, stroking his beard and staring at her with curiosity. Daenerys smirked, turning to the right. A Khaleesi must learn to speak the language of the people she seeks to rule. Laughs echoed from around the hut. I don't know who you rule, witch, Carl Hargo quipped, but I am not one of them. He picked up the bone of a chicken picked clean. Here, you may rule over this. You have my blessing. More laughs. Glancing down at the bone, resting in the sand that covered the floor of the hut, Daenerys shifted her gaze, violet eyes boring on each of the cars. Though all would deny it, many involuntary flinched at the fire blazing within. You are weak men. From the smallest among you, to the great car that sits in the middle of you all. Her gaze ended with Drogo, their eyes meeting. 
Whereas before Illyrio's manse, she was scared, weak little girl. Now the carl was greeted by something altogether different. What matters of great importance do you discuss here? What tiny villages you l burn? What women you are to rape? What spoils you are to request of fat Robert the usurper for doing his dirty work like common cell swords? Drogo stood, anger written all over his face. My sword is for sale to no man. Smirk widening, Daenerys delighted in the fact she could rile them up. Viserys only brought forth himself mockery from those he wished to intimidate. She was about to show the whole world the true power of House Targaryen, long gone from the world, starting with these savage rapists and common thieves. My ancestor was Aegon Targaryen, a man with a thousand men to his name and only ruling an island. Yet with his name and his dragons, he brought an entire continent to heel. The father of my children, his ancestor was Theon Stark, a man that faced hordes of hundreds of thousands and held them off, crossing the bitter water to take the fight to their homelands. She began walking across the bare spot on the floor, making their eyes follow her. They were strong men. You are small men, not fit to lead the Dothraki. And who do you think is, Moro asked with a scoff, you, a frail woman. Daenerys continued walking, feeling the heat of the royal bla braziers waft over her skin. Yes, I will lead them. She kicked the sack at her feet, letting the dragon spill out. They will see how a dragon leads, rather than cockroaches. Making sure to stand tall, showing off all of his height and muscles, Drogo began to advance on her. We will never follow you, witch. His lips curled into a sneer. Forget the betrothal. I am going to rape you here and now. And then we'll let our blood riders rape you. And if there is anything of you left, we will let our horses have a turn. The other carls whooped, pumping their fists in the air as the cl classic Dothraki show of bravado. Watching Drogo grow closer and closer, almost so she could see the whites of his eyes. The metal brazier brushed against the bare skin of her shoulder, other arm reaching behind her, wrapping around black shark skin. Oh, I know you won't serve me. Just as the great Carl was nearly about to reach out and take her neck in his meaty hand, Daenerys drew Saracen. Valyrian steel glinted in the orange firelight. No one had expected such a tiny girl to be armed, and the Carl didn't realise their mistake as Dothraki ran the blade through Drogo's stomach. Looking down at the sword, Shock registering and breaths becoming a struggle, Drogo watched the girl with new eyes, fearful eyes. This wasn't the princess from Pentos, but rather a violet demon, one of the ancient dragon riders that terrorised the Dothraki of old. Falling to his knees as Danny removed the sword, soon the pain began. Around her, the Dothraki all scrambled to their feet. You will won't serve because you are all going to die. Without another word, she kicked the brazier to the ground, dousing all in flames. Feeling the pounding against the door, hearing the screams of the cars and the roaring of the ever-growing flames, Jorah and Barristan stood before the hut. Wooden bar placed against the door, holding it in the building to be engulfed in a great inferno, thatched and wicker going up like kindling. Jorah attempted to race inside when Barristan held him back. Don't. But the Queen! She'll be fine. The old knight replied, smiling warmly. Fire cannot kill a dragon. Her brother was burned on his arm! Barristan snorted. Then he wasn't a dragon. Behind them, the Dothraki began milling about. First dozens, then hundreds, then thousands. All watched the massive pyre erupt, orange-red flames banishing away the darkness of the night. The hours drifted up by, time interminable. Soon it, be it was dawn, the sun still not poking out from behind the mountains that formed the eastern edge of Vaya's Dothraki Bowl. The fire had died down. Jorah approached the smouldering wreckage. In the middle, 
Barristan could barely make out the form of the Queen. A loud screech drew their attention, then their wonder and their horror. It can't be. Impossible. Perched on his unharmed, unburned Queen were three tiny dragons, one as black as coal on her shoulder, one a dark forest green at her breast, and one an icy white clinging to her leg. Dothraki! She thundered in her now fluent grasp of the language, voice carrying over the entire sacred city. Soot matted silver hair blowing in the wind and illuminated by the crackling fires. I have killed your Karls through the strength of my flesh and the steel of my resolve. And by your customs, I have secured your loyalty and obedience. But today, I hereby unshackle you from your chains. You may go about your way. Seek out your own destiny. If you choose to follow me by your own free will, I promise I will never let you down. To consider you not as my servants, but as my family. Anyone that wishes to hurt you will be immolated in pure dragon fire. Previous Karls, brave and noble as they were, measured your worth by middling amounts. They looked at the villages they could pillage, how many women they raped, or how many horses the great cities of the coast could bribe them with. But I think differently, vowing that my children will be the stallions that mount the world. I will carry the legacy of my ancestor, the great Aegon the Conqueror, take you across the narrow sea in the wooden horses that float. To leave the great knights and cities that think you mere barbarians cowering at your feet. I ask you today, will you follow me? An entire horde following the lead of Sir Jorah Mormont and Barristan Selmy kneeling to their queen, one by one until every last man, woman and child in Veastoth Rack pledged fealty to Daenerys Targaryen, mother of dragons. Standing tall, standing proud, Daenerys allowed a small smile upon her face as Balerion spread his wings upon her shoulder and shrieked for the entire world to hear. End of chapter. Hi guys, hope you enjoyed this. Mother of Dragons, yes. Little Arya and little Rhaegar. John making friends with Sam and with Aemon watching, knowing that he is family. Just, yes. Oh, and make sure to keep an eye on Baelish and Joffrey. Something's going to happen there. But I won't spoil until my next video comes out. <laughs> Have a good day, night, or whatever time zone you're in. Bye, my guys, gals, and non-binary pals. Remember to like, comment and subscribe and hit that bell to be notified for never upload a new video. Bye!